Hi, today I want to talk about the RGA or residual gas analyzer that I hooked up to my chamber recently. This specific model here I purchased off eBay and after a few minor electrical repairs here and there I bolted it up to the chamber, gave it power, and Inficon was kind enough to send over the software to me um, to, to play with. So I'll go over the theory briefly and then do a demo of it. So in case you're not familiar with uh, RGAs, a residual gas analyzer is basically a tiny mass spectrometer that you'll see uh, on vacuum chambers kind of standing up as mine was. Most instruments, like vacuum gauges uh, of different types, measure uh, the total pressure in the chamber, but this is special because it allows you to see partial pressures. So it'll print out um, on the computer a graph of um, all the different gases and species you have in the chamber and the partial pressure of each of those. So that's extremely useful for um, all vacuum process control applications. For doing a bake-out, you can see how much water vapor you have left in the chamber. Uh, for leak checking, helium leak checking, you can see uh, the different hydrocarbon compositions. So if you have uh, oil backstreaming from your pump, uh, that'll be really easy to see on the RGA. It's really good for um, knowing if you need to put a cold trap or something like that. So overall, it's a really, really useful tool to have on a vacuum chamber. And you can also do some um, other experiments with it. I, I'm going to be trying some stuff soon with uh, heating up different plastics in the vacuum and looking at the decomposition of those on the RGA, trying to identify the plastics and uh, playing around playing around like that. So there's two big types of RGAs. There's FC and EM, Faraday cup and electron multiplier. And uh, I'll show you how these fit into it later, but basically the Faraday cup works at higher pressures and it starts working at about 1 times 10 to the minus 4 tor and they even make high pressure ones now that uh, are well into the millitor and then it'll function down to about 1 times 10 to the minus 10 tor and the electron multiplier is a much more sensitive instrument and those uh, start working at lower pressures and will take you down uh, really really far it's, it's pretty ridiculous um, it's not useful at all uh, in, in my lab here for, um, for these UHV pressures, but the sensitivity is really, really nice, especially with leak checking. So the instrument that I have uh, actually contains an electron multiplier, but I can switch that off and use it at slightly higher pressures um, and just use the, the, the Faraday cup. So I'll go over what's actually inside of it in a second here, but basically uh, what it does is it separates ions um, by their mass to charge ratio by sweeping an electric field. Um, in the analyzer region of the device. Before I had this, the extent of my vacuum diagnostics were basically looking at a couple of vacuum gauges and saying, okay, it looks good enough, but that really doesn't tell you even a, a part of the whole picture. Um, you can get a few different gauges. You can have a thermocouple gauge and like a um, capacitive gauge, and uh, you can sort of start guessing at what's going on in the chamber more than just um, the pressure, but uh, it really is just guessing. So here's the RGA. On top, in this bluish white box, uh, are the RF generator and the rest of the electronics. And this is a 99.999% argon source, so you can flow that into the chamber very slowly to calibrate the device. I don't have that hooked up right now, uh, but it's pretty well in spec, I think. And then this is the actual analyzer. Uh, right here that connects through a two and three quarter inch conflat to the rest of the chamber. So inside of here there's three main sections. There's the ion source, the quadrupole, and the uh, detector. So the ion source is pretty simple. They normally consist of a filament which generates electrons and smashes those into the residual gas. So it ionizes the residual gas by electron bombardment basically. So down here you have your ions generated and they'll be accelerated with a negative potential toward the quadrupole. And the quadrupole, uh, you can sort of guess what it might be based on the name, but it consists of four parallel cylindrical metal rods uh, in here and they are grouped into two pairs. So opposing pairs are biased um, differently than the, the other ones. So these four rods are biased with a DC voltage, which is held constant to acquire the spectrum, and there's an RF component to that. In my case, it's about 3 megahertz, and the peak uh, amplitude of that uh, RF component is uh, swept from low to high, uh, and that's what uh, 
actually selects the ions. So alternate pairs of these rods are 180 degrees out of phase um, with their, with their uh, other pair. So in the end, this separates ions from their mass to charge ratio. And the way it does that is you have a stream of positively charged ions coming in through here. And at certain DC and RF voltage um, ratios, the trajectory of, that, of those ions as they pass through here will become unstable. And rather than just going right through the center of the detector, they'll actually go off to the side and they'll smash into um, one of those four quadrupole rods and um, they'll be discarded basically. So by varying the RF intensity you can select which ions have a stable trajectory as they go through the uh, analysis tube and will actually get to the detector. And the detector is that Faraday cup or the electron multiplier uh, system we talked about earlier and that's going to be uh, in the upper part of this. And that basically just counts the uh, ion beam current that is striking it. So if you didn't have the uh, quadrupole system in here, if you just had an ion source and the detector, there would be basically no attenuation. So you had one milliamp of uh, ion beam current, which is a lot, you would basically get that uh, on the receiving end. So the quadrupole uh, analyzer system basically attenuates that and um, based on which ions you're letting through and it's the, the uh, ions that are let through are swept in, uh, I guess, a sawtooth fashion. It would start from uh, light elements and then up to heavier elements and then drop back down and the detector sends the uh, electrical signal to the electronics box and uh, amplifies it and then from that information you can gather a spectra. The electric fields generated by the quadrupole are kind of complicated, uh, not that bad once you get into it and you actually start to understand it, but one important thing if you want to dive deeper into the theory of this, they don't provide any acceleration in the z-axis. So if you were to put x and y on the plane of the ends of the uh, quadrupole rods, the z-axis would be this way through um, the center of the four rods. The rods no matter how they're biased in this configuration, do not provide acceleration in that direction. They just provide um, trajectory instability in X and Y positive and negative directions. Okay, so I'll pump down the chamber and then we can start experimenting with it. Okay, please excuse the noise with all the pumps. I've got a mechanical pump and two turbos on right now. And uh, we've been pumping for about five minutes and uh, we're within the pressure range to start the RGA, so that's great. And I'll pump some more. You can see on the screen the pumping curve. Uh, this portion here is the mechanical pump, and then I turned one turbo on, and then waited and I turned a second turbo pump on right there, uh, and now we're approaching the base pressure. So you'll notice the first turbo should have been able to take it down all the way. So we're going to troubleshoot that problem in this video. I already know what it is, because um, I have a, a pretty good suspicion, but I'm going to show you how to use the RGA to troubleshoot that issue. Alright, so we'll head over to the RGA software. And you notice the pressure is still a little bit high. And with these two turbo pumps, or with even just one of these turbos on, we should have no problem getting uh, into 1 times 10 to the minus 6 after just a couple minutes of pumping. And then after a little bit of bake out, minus 7 and minus 8 should not be that far away. So there's obviously something going on here. Um, if the pressure is staying this high, which isn't that bad, but still, um, I know there's an issue. And also, uh, we went to that pumping graph, and such a big difference of having the second turbo on. Alright, so we finally have the sensor connected, we have the RGA connected up. These previous 1, 2, and 3 uh, are, just ignore those, we're looking at position 4 here, this is the RGA. So I'm going to enable emission, and that's going to turn on the ion source basically. And just to get a basic spectra, I'm going to go to configuration monitor. Actually, yeah, configuration monitor. And we're going to scan from atomic mass 0 all the way to 100. So this is the full spectrum here. Make sure my capture is working. Yep. And 
we'll go for one data point per uh, AMU to take forever to scan. So this is going to take 3,600 milliseconds, so three and a half seconds to do the scan. And our mission's on, so we'll go for it. The multiplier is off right now, so we're getting slightly worse sensitivity. And again, with this amount of pumping time, we should be well below this pressure here. And there we have it, the first spectrum appears. So really, really easy to see right off the bat at 18 AMU, we have a huge spike. So that's obviously water vapor. And I recently had the chamber open for a while and uh, for, for maintenance, I was adding some evaporation stuff. So a lot of water has been incorporated into the chamber walls. And the partial pressure of that is very high. So the goal of baking out the chamber is to reduce this water. So all you have left are things like hydrogen, helium, and nitrogen. Um, that's all you really want uh, left over. This time it's uh, half the span of the previous one. We're only going to 50 AMU. It started it, and there we go. We have our spectrum. There's a lot more detail this time. I'm going to let that run for a little bit, and then we'll do some quick analysis on it. You'll notice it gives you the pressure down here uh, on the bottom left. That pressure is a little bit high, um, actually almost an order of magnitude off. I have to calibrate that. The individual partial pressures of all the gases add up to be correct, but this is just a calibration thing. The number on the ion gauge um, is much more accurate. So now we are identifying some species out of the spectrum. So H2O, as I said, is going to be really, really high. And uh, nitrogen and oxygen peaks are much smaller. We have hydrogen, and uh, the amount of hydrocarbons in the chamber are pretty good, actually. So uh, a little bit of um, oil, basically, uh, up here. Um, a little bit higher than I want it to be, but it's, it's all right. The reason why the water peak is much higher than everything else is not because there's more of it uh, ambient in the air. You would expect mostly just oxygen and nitrogen um, if you were going to follow that logic, but the water actually bonds very strongly to the stainless walls of the chamber and actually bonds to most surfaces. So it'll stick into the chamber and incorporate itself a lot more easily than everything else. I'm going to bake it out in a little bit, and uh, I would expect to see this water line come down a lot. And you shouldn't even expect, um, with a turbo pump, to get much below 1 times 10 to the minus 6 when you have this bad of a uh, water incorporation problem. So that the bake out's very critical to this. So I'm going to stop this, and uh, I didn't really see anything too alarming down here of why the, uh, we had those issues before with the pressure. Uh, fluctuating and that interesting pumping curve that I talked about because there's not a whole lot of backstream oil and everything else looks okay so we're going to do a helium leak check and hopefully that'll find the problem so we'll enter the leak checking mode we're looking for helium atomic mass 4 uh, helium's used it permeates very very well into all the cracks between o-rings and, and stuff like that so uh, I keep the multiplier on, I want as much sensitivity as possible uh, uh, this time around, and I'll go ahead and start the leak check. So we have audio, and that's great, so I can walk around um, to the chamber and use a helium wand. Here, I'll demonstrate this for you. So I've got to take a helium here, hook it to this wand, I have the flow rate set very, very low. When you do leak checking, you'll start with this helium uh, high and you'll work your way low. And the reasoning for that is helium is lighter than air, so it rises. If you were to start down here and you get a high reading of helium, it could be that fitting or any of the fittings directly above it. So I already did this and I know where the problem is, but I'll just demonstrate for you what it should look like. You'll start the helium flow and slowly pass it over any suspicious fittings that you might uh, think are leaking. And these conflats have a very low probability of having an issue because they're a metal to metal to metal seal, but it's, uh, it's possible. So I would check like this thoroughly throughout the entire chamber, and I'm going to skip right to the problem because I found it earlier. And I should have known better, but in the backing line of this uh, turbo here, I used some, ca um, some Teflon tape 
on these pipe fittings here and uh, that's not really suitable for high vacuum so I knew it would be a bit of a problem but I thought I could get away with it whatever it is what it is and by the way uh, I had the previous turbo on here this is a 110 liter per second turbo and uh, I added this 50 liter per second turbo because I was having a lot of outgassing when doing thermal evaporation and couldn't keep the low pressures so it's not helping for lower base pressure but uh, a little more pumping speed is good so anyway I'll demonstrate this right here That one's okay, a little bit of leaking, but then this one's pretty bad. So it's pretty cool, it makes it really obvious that uh, it's a pretty awful leak. Yep. Okay, so that's all for this video. I just turned the mechanical pump off and you can hear the two turbos winding down. I hope you learned something and found that interesting. If you have any suggestions for me or questions, feel free to leave a comment or uh, send me an email. Uh, you can get my email address on my blog. Thanks for watching.